Coming up on Kentucky Outlook, you know, it has been said that we only hurt the ones we love. And sadly, that's all too true in situations of domestic abuse. Statistics indicate that each year more than 3 million children witness domestic violence in their homes. What's being done in this region to combat domestic violence and to help the victims? We're going to talk with representatives of Brass, the Barren River Area Safe Space, when Kentucky Outlook continues next. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. I'm your host, Barbara Deeb. You know, statistics indicate that one in four women will be the victims of some type of domestic abuse in their lifetime. What is being done to combat the situation? Well, since, well, about the last 34 years in the Barren River area, the Barren River Area Safe Space has been there to help victims and their children. We're going to find out more about that and an initiative to get women into the workforce as we welcome to the program the director of Brass, Lee Alcott, joins us. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Barbara. In addition, the assistant director, Pam Hurt, is joining us. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Now, you know, let's, let's first, for our audience, define what we're talking about when we say domestic abuse. What does that look like? What is that? Well, domestic abuse takes a lot of different venues. Um, there's physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, isolation, sexual abuse, anything that um, a perpetrator can use to have control over an individual. So really at the core, at the essence, we're talking about a control We're situation. talking about power and control. That's where you could trace every case that we work with back to that uh, need to have power and control over an individual. We, in the introduction, I mentioned the fact that for more than three decades now, Brass has been there to help victims of domestic abuse. Take us back to those, to those early days when, I know you weren't involved with them then, but that seven Warren County individuals came together and said, there's a need in our community, we're gonna make this happen. Yes, it was like 1979, a, a group of citizens got together and met, from what I have heard, in closets, anywhere they could meet to strategize um, on how they could create a safe space for women and children fleeing abuse. At that time in our nation's history, there was a lot of focus on helping women because they were the, um, the highest percentage of victims were and still are female. And they um, decided to have a bake sale and they were able to get $1,000 from the city to house the first two families in a local hotel. That was in 1980. Um, beca they became incorporated, and I'm sure at that time they had no idea that 34 years later there would still not only be a need for a safe space, but a need to grow and expand. And that's happening across our state. Shelters are expanding because the need is so critical. And you are now funded in part through United Way. Yes, United Way of Southern Kentucky funds our 24 hour, our two 24 hour crisis lines, our language lines, so that we can communicate okay. with victims in other languages. Um, I think 235 languages are, we have access to. Um, they fund our overnight shift so that we can have trained advocates on staff 24 hours a day. And then we receive funding in some of our outreach counties to provide services. Okay, Pam, I got one for you here. <laughs> 15 domestic violence shelters in the Commonwealth. Yes. Okay. But from what you told me before we started this interview, the one in the Barren River region really gets a lot more calls and requests than many of the, the domestic violence shelters in larger cities? Yes, for the last four years, we've had over 5,000 crisis calls. Last year, we had around 5,200. Um, and word of mouth from former clients, um, you know, we, we do a lot of promotion. We have a website. Um, we're just out in the community a lot. And in our outlying counties as well, having office space in other um, counties, I think that also raises awareness. So you think it's more a, a, an issue of you're out there, people know you exist, whereas in maybe some of the outlying areas of the state where these other 14 domestic violence shelters are located, maybe they're not doing quite as good a job with awareness <laughs> as you are. I just know we're out there a lot, and I think it makes a big difference. And we um, 
talk a lot to our judges, a lot to our law enforcement, and we get a lot of referrals from them as well. Um, and we also have a police-based advocate here in Warren County, so I think that makes a difference too. She's doing a lot of follow-ups and reaching out to a lot of other calls, um, and we're having more access. Well, and one of the things you pointed out, which I think is just amazing, word of mouth is the is the the greatest way that people find out about you. So break that down for me. What does that what does that mean? So if someone who has used your services goes out into the community and and spreads the word, is that to say then that they they actually acquaint themselves with others who might be in the same situations, or what do you, how do you explain that? I think mostly it's um, a sensitivity that a survivor has so that someone who has experienced domestic violence is more sensitive to someone else who might not have told anyone that she's a victim or that she's going through abuse at home. But they might, they know the signs and the symptoms and are more likely to say, is someone hitting you? you know, what's happening, you haven't returned phone calls, or I notice you've been late for work. A lot of it happens in the workplace. It, that's anecdotal information that we get from former clients who mm -hmm. stay in touch with us um, through the crisis line or letters. We get a lot of letters. So um, it demonstrates, you know, that we're, we're doing a good job in the sense of um, providing services that are needed services for those trying to escape abuse. There, there is a myth in society that all women who are being abused go back to their abuser, and that's just a myth. We have more women going out on their own, becoming self-sufficient, accessing safe housing, and getting jobs, and having their own income than we do those who go back to their abusers. You know, early, a uh, little bit ago, you were talking about, you know, the, the genesis of Barron River Area Safe Space. And you said, you know, the statistics indicate that more women are victims. But that is not to say that you don't have males who are victims. Exactly. Well. We, we do serve a small percentage of males. I think nationally, the trend is 87% of identified victims are female. So there, there is a large number of male victims. And um, Pam could probably speak more to our outreach services where we, we see more male victims calling for help or filing for a protective order. What, what does that mean? Um, approximately about 10 to 13 percent of our, of our clientele are male. And once um, we, we do see a lot of male victims, a lot of times in the outlying counties, um, I do think word of mouth and with our police-based advocate, we are being made aware of any assault or terroristic threatening or anything along those lines where the males are the victims. And so through that, we we're able to reach out to the male victims and, and become more in, in tune with their services and their needs. Well, let's talk about those services and needs because it, it's difficult enough for any victim to come forward, I would, mm -hmm. I would expect. To, it's, it's, I guess, like being um, how they talk about alcoholism where someone has to admit that they have a problem. For a woman to say, you know, she may know that she is being victimized, but it may become her normalcy. So how do, you, how do you get them to take that next step? Accessibility is a key. Um, that's why our 24-hour crisis lines are so important. Those, we have two crisis lines that are answered tw 24 hours a day every day of the year by a trained advocate. And our advocates are trained to respond, not to put up more barriers for someone calling. So that even though we might not have an immediate answer, we'll give them information on someone who could have that answer. If we have to bring them into the shelter at two in the morning, we use local law enforcement to make that happen. So we try to be as accessible as possible to as many callers as we can. But, but coming forward, and then as you mentioned, the word of mouth, someone who's used your services, looks for those red flags in another human being that says, maybe this person is a victim and maybe I can help them get the help yes. they need. Yes, and many victims have told us, because um, the question often comes up, well, why didn't you tell someone? And they'll say, well, no one asked me. Oh. And so we okay. encourage um, even employers to ask the question if they have a human resource department um, who meets with their employees and they suspect there is abuse, to, to gently ask that question. And I know there's a, you know, in a move, uh, there's a movement for physicians to ask that question in emergency rooms. We get a lot of referrals from emergency rooms across our service area. So many times it's just a matter of asking the question, is someone hurting you? And there might be denial in the beginning, 
We have women who call our crisis line who won't give us a lot of information at first, but the, the third time they call, they'll have more courage and they'll be able to say what is happening and then we do safety planning with them if they ha decide to leave. Um, because at that time of separation, there's a uh, significant rise in the risk of lethality or homicide because the perpetrator would be losing control. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that that caller knows the safest time for her to leave. So take us through, if you would. I'm thinking of that movie, maybe you saw the movie with Julia Roberts, Sleeping with the Enemy, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. she went to great extremes to get, get away from her very controlling husband, okay? Maybe you haven't seen that movie. So take us through um, a phone call, an average phone call that you get to the 24-hour crisis line. We would, you know, answer the phone, um, hopefully with a calm voice, even though our crisis office gets very hectic sometimes and um, you mean hectic in the sense of number of calls number of calls residents coming into the office when someone's on a crisis call um, because we're also accessible to our shelter residents 24 hours a day uh, cabs coming to pick someone up to take them to work so there's just a that's the heartbeat of our agency that office um, the first thing we would do after we get some identifying information, if they're willing to give it to us, and they don't have is, to, they don't have to, mm -hmm. is to establish safety. Are you safe now? Is your abuser in the home? Will he or she be home in the next five minutes? And then we go through a series of questions. We have some required questions that we have to ask for our state contract. Um, most of the questions have to do with safety, and we ask them if you know they would like to come into the shelter. If they do, we make those arrangements either with local law enforcement, um, rural law enforcement or state police to escort or transport them in. We don't pick up, although way back when we used to pick clients up to bring them in, but because of safety issues, we don't do that anymore. I think statistics <laughs> will indicate that for police officers and law enforcement individuals, domestic issues are probably one of the most dangerous that they face yeah, so that's, in their careers. Yeah, so they're, yeah. they're so gracious and um, when we call, uh, no matter if it's Warren County or Monroe County or Simpson County, we get a, a positive response. And if, if one of the smaller police departments cannot transport, then we'll call because they only have two people on shift, we would call state police and they're just very accommodating to our needs and take it seriously. They understand if, if a woman has been accepted into, a into the shelter, it's because there is the risk of lethality and danger. And so they respond very quickly. Got to get them out of the house. Yes. And if someone does not want to come into the shelter, we go through a safety plan on the phone with her about you know where she could go to stay safe if she needs to stay in the home, how she can do that safely. And how can she do that safely if she needs to stay in the home and her abuser is there? We encourage, um, you know, and there's no guarantee. You know, we, mm -hmm. we never insinuate that this is a perfect plan at all. We like to hear from that caller where she feels safe in the home. Sometimes it's, it's near a door if she, um, many victims cannot, know when th the triggers in that violent mm -hmm. relationship so if an abuser comes home in a certain mood or with a certain look they might hover kind of stay closer. by the door yes stay by the door we're going to have to take a short break here on kentucky outlook but we want to hear more we're talking with representatives of barren river area safe space uh, who help people in situations of domestic violence kentucky outlook continues right after this Kentucky Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and, of course, go to our YouTube channel where you can find archived editions of Kentucky Outlook. We're talking today about the issue of domestic violence. One in four women will be the victim of domestic violence in their lifetime, and more than three million children are affected by domestic violence every year. We're talking with Lee Alcott and Pam Hurt, the director and the assistant director of Barron River Area Safe Space, a, a facility that's designed to help women in these situations. Now, I did say women, but it also applies to men. You said you have a small percentage of men who, yes, provide, yes. who use we, the services? About 10 to 13 percent of our male or our victims are male, and we a lot of times see them in outreach offices and meet with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis to provide 
individual counseling and offer services for them that can benefit them. Okay, the burning question is, in a situation where you have male, a male as a victim, who's doing the abuse? Is it the wife, the partner? It, it could be, typically, yes. It also could be a same-sex couple. And mm -hmm. so um, it's sometimes hard to, to, to try to differentiate who the primary victim is in some types of situations. But we do the best we can, and you know, we offer the same services and try to assist them in the same way we would with any victim of domestic violence. And when we talk about recap for our audience that might be just joining us, when we talk about domestic violence, you know, domestic, you, you get that part, but the violence is, is, there's an umbrella. I mean, there's so many different areas. Recap that for us, if you will. And I, I like the image of the umbrella because there are so many prongs to it. it, it um, it's physical abuse, emotional and psychological abuse. It's also financial abuse, sexual abuse, isolation, anything that a perpetrator can use to exert power and control over a victim. Because as we indicated in the first segment of the show, it's all about control. It's all about power and powerless. Yes. Okay. So uh, some people will say, well, why do these people, these victims, let themselves stay in that situation? Why don't they just leave? And Pam and I have heard that question. <laughs> I bet. We call it the million dollar question. Um, we've even heard some judges ask a victim that in the courtroom during a domestic violence hearing. And we, we would rather ask, why is he abusing her? Why is he still hitting her? Um, you know, Kentucky has some pretty strong laws against domestic violence, but they're not strong enough. We would like to see perpetrators held more accountable for the assaults um, and for the uh, intimidation that occurs, the threats of violence. and that. That threat of violence can be almost as powerful as being beaten because you never know if he or she is going to actually act out on that threat. So, so you live in constant fear. Exactly. And Pam can talk a little bit more about the protective order statute that does have a, a section on fear in there to, that demonstrates really? how serious that is. Yeah, the, the CARA statute, the 40372, actually has within the statute, if you are in imminent fear of being physically or sexually abused, that can qualify as being a victim of domestic violence. So you don't have to be physically assaulted or, or anything along those lines. If he is intimidating you and threatening you and putting those thoughts into your head that he's going to do those things, then yes, that is enough to show you are in imminent fear of bodily harm, period. And so it, it makes it clear cut that, that a threat of violence is enough. Let's, let's take a look at the perpetrators for a moment, okay? We talked about for victims, often it's normalcy. Maybe they came from a situation as a child where they were sexually or physically abused. For them then, that becomes, this is my normal. So then they get into a relationship as an adult where there's abuse, and it doesn't seem odd because that's their normal. For perpetrators, do we also find that to be the case? I think for a certain yeah. percentage, um, per, a certain percentage of perpetrators have grown up in a home where there was violence. So that is what that child, that yes. person learned as a child. And but that's not across the board. Um, we are often asked to, you know, profile a perpetrator, and it's very difficult to do. I mean, if you just think about the the recent. Um, information coming out of the National Football League. Uh, th that demonstrates that domestic violence has no boundaries. Mm -hmm. It can happen in high-end marriages, and um, it's not just poor people who experience domestic violence. Um, that, um, we often hear that, you know, people assume that it's just people who don't have means. The people who don't have resources are the, often the ones who call us, but we also often get calls from people in high-end marriages or, you know, who are well off, who need some assistance because they don't know how to get out. And they, they could be being abused financially, which would really crush them. Um, say if they left, they would, they would be homeless or could you be know, homeless. You know, you mentioned that in the beginning, and I think uh, I, could see, I could see a lot of our audience out there going, financial abuse, what are we talking about there? So in other words, you've got a couple 
and one of the partners decides they're going to pool the financial resources, that would be considered financial abuse? That's one example. Um, we often work with women who have not been allowed to work. Not been allowed to work. They have not been allowed to control their own money if they do work. They have had to um, accept an allowance. They've had to ask for money to get groceries and then make sure that that receipt balances out. There, there's so many different aspects of financial abuse. Um, we see abusers who destroy the credit of some of the women we work with, and well, then that's one I hadn't thought about. Okay. Then uh, we have to we help them rebuild that credit so they can become self-sufficient. Uh, can you think of any other? aspects of that. It, um, it's something people don't think about. No, not at all. You know, not being allowed to um, use the ATM card. Uh, we've had victims who don't even know their PIN number to their food stamp card or their ATM card to be even to, to be able to access those resources or they would have changed them and stolen them before they could. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like she said, to, to um, run up their credit cards. Like they will get credit cards in and their name their and totally credit. run their, mm -hmm, run their credit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then leave them with um, utility bills and not have a way to pay it if, if they decide to leave. We've had people come in with, what, eight, nine hundred dollar mm -hmm. utility bills and there's no way to get the money that quick to pay that off. So they come to you because they're fed up, they decide they want, I need help. They say, I need help, help me. I think there's a line. I think for every, I think what I've learned over the years is for every woman or every victim there's a line and it's different for everybody mm -hmm. and it could be the financial exploitation it could be it could be some sort of physical event it could be something as simple as um, a small trinket that got destroyed could say that's it I'm done mm -hmm. and I think you have to find that line in the sand and for every victim it's different but when they do they come to you yes. and so you get these calls as you mentioned you have trained individuals and advocates who are answering these the 24-hour yes. crisis line for which you have two lines somebody calls they may not want to identify who they are right from mm -hmm. the get-go but what you have found and what I'm getting a sense you're saying is that often they will call back yes. and then call back again and with each call there seems to be a little more courage that comes Yes. a little more bravery like finally I am going to do something about this then what happens when you finally find out you've got some identification mm -hmm. you go get it get them mm -hmm. does it have to be a certain risk involved before you'll go and help them and get them no out of that no the, it's really just a request for help when they're ready for help whether um, most of the the women who come into the shelter are in some type of immediate danger and that's our priority because there's no other place for them to go do you um, get calls when when an event's happening right then yes. where he's he's got a gun yes. he's standing here he's really sometimes yes okay. and sometimes we have to talk to them and call the police on another line and keep them on the line while the police mm -hmm. are going oh to respond to the call we get a lot of calls from minute marts um i Women where in there's the actually process, a phone booth? Is there, there still a phone booth? Somewhere? Where they're allowed to use the phone oh, at the okay. Minute Mart. Um, and that, it's an interesting phenomenon. It started happening two years ago. And um, sometimes the manager will call us on the victim's behalf and then give her the phone or the, they'll let the victim use the phone and call us. But they were in the process of leaving or pretending they were going to get some milk or something and it was an opportune time to get away and then we would keep them on the phone and send the police to get them to bring them into the the shelter so that um, I can't remember how many times that happened but it made us kind of think about that and try to figure out why all of a sudden we're getting all these call calls from Minute Mart. So Probably word of mouth mm -hmm. that's how I got away someone says yes let's mm -hmm. take a look at these individuals who have children as we indicated at the beginning of the program, more than three million children are affected by some type of domestic abuse in the country. Children, they're, they're helpless victims, and they're witnessing what's happening between perhaps a married couple and unmarried couple, but the people that they know as their caregivers. How, how do you handle that? In all instances, are you able to get the children out with the parent? Most of the time, there, there have been some times where um, the perpetrator 
fled with the child and we would call law enforcement immediately um, to hopefully get the, the victim reunited with that child. But most of the time, if the victim has custody of her children, they come into the shelter with them. Sometimes we have up to 20 children in our shelter. Oh we have a, a comprehensive children's program, a child advocate who works with the moms and the children. We help get them into school, into preschool, into daycare, uh, and then work with them so they can express some of their experiences. Uh, we find that often not to the same school they were going to, right? Because that could right. present an issue with the other. They go to uh, local schools usually, but if the parent wants them to stay in their home school, they have a right uh, based on federal law to stay in that home school and for the home school to transport them. And that's where our advocacy comes in um, to quote that law to make sure that happens, if it's in the best interest of the child. All about the best interest of the child. Yes. We look at victims, we look at perpetrators, we talk about control and power. But what we're really looking at here is very low self-esteem. An individual who has low self-esteem doesn't have enough, they have to exert that power or they become victims. Getting someone to the place where they again have some self-esteem, that, that's a journey, isn't it? It is a journey and it could be a long journey. Um, it really depends on the inner strength of the um, person coming into our services. Um, and how we're able to open some doors, whether you know we can get them into housing or uh, we work to help them get into the job force because a lot of the women who come have not worked um, or have just you know worked minimal hours. So part of our strategy is to get funding to create uh, career readiness programs and help them become self-sufficient. Uh, Having a little money of your own can be a powerful change in someone's life. And Very we see powerful. that every day when someone does get a job and oh, then gets that first paycheck. I bet. And you have a program, it's called the Dress for Success. This is the fifth annual Dress for Success program, sponsored in part by the Junior Women's Club. And what you do is you provide clothing, professional clothing, for yes. women to help make the transition into the workforce. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, five years ago, the Bowling Green Junior Women's Club approached us about wanting to donate clothing. Our, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that, and we wanted to find a way to make it more about the women and how to kind of rebuild them. So it became more of a dress for success, which is what we call the program, you know, where they can come in and find some, some clothing, some nice professional clothing, so that when they go in to do an interview, you know, if you do feel better about yourself, you're obviously going to interview well. And if you interview well, you can hopefully come away with a job and, you know, that, you know, that first step, you know, just going in there and taking the initiative and giving yourself that choice. And that's the biggest thing, letting, letting them choose their own outfit. You know, we, we unfortunately have come across situations where they've been told what to wear, where to go, who to see, what they can Finally, do. Finally, they have and they some get, power. And they get some choice. And that, to see them come in and pick out their outfits and, and the jewelry and the accessories and everything that goes with it. An immediate it's like transition. A, yeah, yeah, their whole demeanor changes. And they become so, it's just happy. And you can just see it. And it's nice making a difference in our community. It's called the fifth annual Dress for Success. We've been talking with representatives of the Barron River Area Safe Space. And if you want to find out more, if you know someone who's in a domestic violence situation, we're going to put up a telephone number for the crisis line and for the office line. Pam Hurt, thank you so much. And as always, Lee Alcott, thank you so much thank for you, being Barbara. here. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us.